Well, welcome back to Reviving an Idler. In this episode, we're going to be looking at a sculling ore, how we go about making one and testing it out. Well, sculling is an incredibly useful skill to have. Um, I've mainly used it on dinghies and smaller boats. Uh, however, I wanted to see if I could get a yacht to move under uh, arm power alone. So I set myself the task of building a little oar. And when I say little, I mean about 20 odd feet long, so not quite so little. Well, good morning folks. We are back aboard Mithril this morning. And I'm out here on this beautifully flat, glassy calm day to try out our sculling oar. The infamous sculling oar that we have been talking about for the last little while. Now it is a big, big bit of kit. Big heavy thing. But that's good. As they say in the movies, if it does not work, you can always hit him with it. But heavy carries the weight, it pushes things forward. So even though you've got this nice balance point at the back of the boat there, you can actually get about one knot out of it when you're throwing your, your body weight around. When you're just plodding along like this, you're just generating enough speed to keep the painter tight on the dinghy there. Now, there is no wind at all today, so it's a perfect day for testing this out. Um, well, flag's fluttering a little bit, but there's there's very little. This is the most we've had all morning, so I might even manage to get my sails up. You never know. Big negative for sculling. This is tiring. You've got to hold on to this. Now, the lanyard attachment down here, from here to the deck, I'm not fitted right now, and that is mainly because the tiller's in the way. So I need to find a way of better balancing the tiller so I can actually use that tool properly. Um, but because of the length of the oar and the pivot point basically roughly being in the middle of the blade, it's not too much work to actually hold it down or anything. But as we have no sails up just now, we're getting a good roll on, so I hope I'm not making you sick for this video. The boat is rolling like a pig. As you can see, you can see this. That's not the swell that's doing that, that's just the momentum of pushing back and forth. Ooh. It is, however, absolutely lovely to be making headway, albeit with the tide, in what would be almost unsailable conditions without having a noisy outboard rattling away in the background there. I'm going to do my best to film a couple of angles so you can see more of what's going on back there. Um, I am by myself on the boat today, so I'm not entirely sure I'm going to get everything perfect for you, but I'm going to do my best. As this is an experimental uh, piece for me, I wanted to try and build it using the cheapest materials possible, so I just used off-the-shelf pre-dressed pine. I did choose some good grain and uh, made sure there wasn't too many knots and that kind of stuff, so I chose nice pieces of wood, but it was by no means what you would call good quality wood. The ore is made from three planks, about 22 mil thick, simply glued together and then carved out from that shape once the glue set. 
Right, so now that you've got the picture of what we're doing and why we did it, uh, let's have a look at the building process. First thing we're going to do is layer our boards. Uh... Now I have them arranged like this, so the bottom part is the curvature of the grain running that way. Middle section doesn't really matter, it can be either way, and the outer section of the top is arranged that the curvature is running that way across. Find the centre line and mark that down. Now that we have the centre line marked, we have our um, datum line or our, our baseline, and I'm looking to then create a template in which I can actually get the shape of the uh, blade section of the paddle roughed out. And for that I'm going to use a piece of plywood. Now this is actually an offcut of one of the planks I used in making um, an Agatha here. And it's actually got a really nice sweep to it already. I don't know if you can quite see that. I quite like that curve. It's already there. Um, I like it. It looks pretty. We're going to use it. Saves me messing about trying to get too technical with things. Um, you could draw it by eye, you can draw it by hand. At this section, you could even leave it square to be honest. It's kind of almost an irrelevant um, at this point. I think this will give us something nice, but I need to make this fit our actual paddle. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to simply lay it down, orientate it by eye, find the widest part, and then I'm going to be using uh, my sliding rule again just to match the outside edge of this to the center line of the uh, stock mark the centre line that's on the stock, back onto the template, create that line and then cut off the, the, the flush. So these little dotted markers you're seeing here, they indicate the centre line of the template, I'll line them up, cut them out flat, uh, plane them smooth and then that I can put against the centre line of any bit of my flat stock and that should give me the, the template of the uh, paddle or one half of the paddle. And to put all of that into context, that's what I mean. Lay the template down on top of the stock, orientate the widest part against the, the outer side of your flat stock, and then I just simply want to line this up with where I think I want the paddle to be. Looks a pretty sweet line there. One bit we want to make sure we get right, and that is the thickness of the shaft, the blade shaft. Now that's going to be around about 60 mil, so I need to make sure that the half of my template uh, is no less than 30 mil or half of the, the, the stock uh, shaft thickness. So, just to prove that there, that thickness there, 30 mil, which makes that then the centre line, that's the drawing edge or the running edge of my template, place that on my centre line, which means that would be the edge of my template. Then keeping that where it's supposed to be, you can work back, making sure the widest part of this comes flush with there, and that's going to give me a nice curved shape. To then transfer the centre line from the stock to the template, very, very straightforward. Take my square edge, line it up with the halfway line centre point on the planking, and then keeping it in line with the stock, make various marks. Keeping the template where it is. All the way along. Until we have enough marks that we can then just line that up as it should be. Stick on a rule, line them up, mark it down, cut it and plane it smooth. And all we have to do then, once that's cut out, draw around, flip it over, draw around it again bingo bongo on each of our three slices and that gives us a good place to, to work from. So this is the pre-gluing mock-up for the um, ULO or the, the sculling ore that I'm making for Second Haven, soon to be renamed. 
and um, just making sure we've got a bit of a curve, everything's kind of clamping up all right, and uh, we can just sort of make sure everything's going to take the bend as it should be um, without putting any undue stress points. Now there is a bit of a curve in it, uh, and I want that to be there because that is my uh, version of the, the Yulo. Having that little sort of bend in it allows the sculling order to work more efficiently so you're not using your muscles. Um, also, because of the way that Second Haven is designed, she has a sort of large outboard uh, compartment at the back, so you won't be sculling from the absolute uh, stern. You're actually sitting a, a good five to six feet um, inboard uh, of, of the back of the boat of the aft. Um, so actually having this bit of curve um, allows me to use a slightly shorter sculling oar. If it was perfectly straight, you're needing quite a long oar to cover the distance from the transom uh, to the, the water level. Whereas having a bit of a sweep allows that to drop in uh, a bit better. So it allows me to take a uh, better economy of the space on board and the, the materials used in its construction. I'll be disassembling this in a second and putting it back together using uh, a resortinol glue. Um, the reason being for that is um, it just cures slightly better uh, at lower temperatures than uh, an epoxy, so we don't have to worry about keeping the fire uh, going throughout the night or anything. Uh, but it's also nice to have something built right the first time you'll have to worry about in the future. Then we end up with something that looks a little bit like that. Well, more clamps would be a bonus. Um, plenty of compression there. The screws are helping out. The curvature in the wood is also acting to pull the layers together. Obviously, we've got a high point here. That point's fixed, and this side is being pulled down. So that adds a lot of pressure uh, to the, the, the full pile. I'll put an extra couple of clamps onto this. Let this cure. 24 hours or so, and then we should be able to start working on shaping it up. Yeah, so that all seems to be working quite nicely. We have the blank made up, glue's holding fine. I can't see any evidence of failure or loose spots anywhere, so that's all good. And we've quickly taken the, uh, the big plane over both sides just to bring it back down to the planned dimensions. So the next phase is to make up a quick jig that we can get the, uh, the angle of the taper onto the blade and also to start squaring off uh, the shaft of the oar and that's going to happen in pretty much the same way as you would do a spar so we've got four corners and we're going to knock the corners off making a sort of hexagonal essentially is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight octagonal sorry and then we're going to make it into a 16 tagonal and then into a something else tagonal so we just keep knocking the angles off and getting it closer to the round and um, there's not really going to be any pronounced taper as we come towards the end of the blade it's going to be more or less the same thickness throughout and the reason for that is it's obviously going to be taking a lot of force it's a long long oar so we do need a uh, decent strength all the way throughout the length of the blade and um, so we don't have to worry about tapering that off uh, too much anything i do do will be done purely and simply by eye as we get towards the latter stages uh, but first of all i need to get the blade cleaned up and dropped down so as you can see it's still very blocky and what I'm looking to try and do is to take the center point and knock off this corner this raised corner until it meets flush with the edge of the the outer uh, plank and that's going to be the thickness of the end blade so fair bit of material to remove from the top part here and the same on the bottom but I'm going to make a quick cardboard jig of the angles that I need uh, to attack that and that's going to make things a little bit simpler uh, for judging where we are as I move down the blade. Okay, so the jig is dead simple. It's a piece of 
cardboard and I've measured a point between here and here which is the width of the widest part of the blade and I've measured up the thickness of the plank above it which is up to this line here and I found the centre point and then marked uh, two centimetres either side of that and I've drawn a straight line from that point which corresponds to that line and that line out to where it would meet the flat surface of there. So hopefully what's going to end up happening is we're going to end up with a, a flat angle from there straight to the edge of that blade there, taking off this entire corner here. <coughs> but that's going to give us the approximate shape uh, to the blade before I can start rounding it off. Very simple, very straightforward, uh, allows us to remove a lot of material very, very quickly. So that's looking pretty good, quite happy with that, knocked the corners off, uh, still obviously a lot of smoothing out to go, fairing that into that piece etc, but we're going to flip it over, do the same to the underside of the blade, and then we're going to start cleaning up the, the corners of the shaft. After we start squaring off and taking the corners off, you end up with something that looks like this, a six-sided or eight-sided shape, and carries on down the loom here onto the blade, which I've been loosely shaping by eye uh, and using the template as you just saw, just to kind of uh, give that a rough shape, and then we take the high spots off and smooth the whole lot out giving you a rounded profile. We still have this edge raised here at the moment because I want to then span that gap with the planes and that will give me the curvature uh, around here to give that uh, a rounded edge. considerations I've had when I was designing this uh, sculling lower slash yellow is um, I needed it to be robust, I needed it to be very long and I needed to kind of self-tail or self, you know, look after itself as you're actually paddling so you're not relying on twisting and turning your wrist and that's where the yulo element comes into it. Now, now yulos are designed by nature of the, the bend between the, the shaft and the, the blade to kind of uh, skull naturally as, the, as you drag the blade across um, the pivot point, the, the sort of the trailing end or this part of the blade will lag behind the, uh, the angled part up here or my wrist and it will kind of naturally do that which sets the uh, blade angle to the correct pitch uh, for your sculling motion. I'm more used to using oars um, which you do exactly the same thing, but instead of relying on a mechanical advantage in the actual uh, shaft of your paddle, you alter the pitch of the blade by alternating the angle of your wrist by twisting the actual oar itself. Uh, the advantage of the oar is that uh, so provided you have a good anchoring point in the, uh, the roll lock or whatever you're using, um, you can actually scull backwards. You can actually move the boat in a backwards direction by simply changing the, the angle of, of pitch on the blade. It's very difficult to do that with a Yulo unless you can actually physically grab the oar and force the tip ahead of the actual pivot point. Um, now, as this is for uh, Second Haven, the vessel set is still quite small. In fact, it's actually um, slightly bigger than Idler, and that's part of the reason that we're practicing building a, a Yulo for Idler uh, with Second Haven, so we get used to the idea. Um, and practice what um, I may need to know for transfer uh, far in the future onto Idler. As for the blade, however, it might be difficult to see because it's quite a large thing on, on quite a small camera, but you'll see that there's a, there's a, a gentle curve um, or a convex sort of face to the outside or the aft 
side of your paddle. And that um, can be perfectly flat. Okay, you can make that as flat as you like. Um, in fact, it's going to be coming down a little bit flatter than it is already. Uh, and that is the, the driving face. That's the face which is actually going to be turned into the, the, the water and forcing the water away from the boat. On the inside face, you'll notice we have this kind of raised area, this rib. Uh, and that adds strength to the actual paddle itself because you don't want too much flexing inwards as it's, as it's working. Uh, you want that nice and rigid so it presents a, a good solid force to the waves. But also if you imagine this is turning and going that way through the water, forcing the water away, it prevents a much cleaner and nicer angle uh, to the water so you get less drag on the underside um, over here forcing the blade through, flip it around and you've got that angle again here uh, digging in and, and cutting and making it a bit easier to move. Similarly, you could have this paddle completely flat, in fact the traditional Euros were, um, as I believe, boards of wood essentially, um, come up, scarfed onto a straight piece of wood. I mean, they were very, very simple, but very, very effective and intelligent tools. I'm choosing this Yulo uh, Ore Hybrid primarily because it's a very effective tool. It uses mechanics over muscle strength for actually applying the driving force aft, which means if you do have to scull for any prolonged period of time, it's going to be a lot easier on you uh, as the, uh, the, the pilot to actually move the boat um, without stressing yourself or hurting yourself. So that's a real advantage. And a separate perk entirely is the actual curvature throughout the paddle allows me to stow this aboard a fairly small boat quite simply because the curvature here will tie in next to the, the stanchion rails um, and allow you to actually pack the paddle aboard down the side or down the side of the gunnel or something like that on deck uh, without it sticking out over the end or sticking out over the aft so it makes it a slightly more uh, user friendly uh, tool to have on board and ultimately that's what this is, it's a tool do the job in the event the engine fails or you just want to make some uh, headway uh, in flat cam conditions without resorting to using a noisy, messy, smelly engine. So next on the list is simply to just knock these corners off so we get ourselves a round shaft. Continue to plane this down. Now I am just going to do this by eye. Um, I like to credit myself with having a fairly decent eye for spotting differences and inconsistencies uh, in the, the wood, so I'm just going to shave this down to meet this edge here, everything smooth. This side does not need to match the underside, so I'm pretty confident we can do this. If we had to make both sides match, I'd make myself up a couple of templates so we can actually get things uh, equal on both sides. But as it stands, simply eyeing down the centre line is going to see me alright I think for this one. dusty and start sanding this down, getting it nice and smooth and ready for painting. Now I've done a very very good job, if I don't mind saying so myself, of getting this down nice and even with the planes. So I don't have a great job to do, so I can hit this with a bit of 80 grit paper, just using my hands, just to take those last few remaining ridges off. Then I'll go over the whole thing with the sat power sander, uh, with a lighter grade paper, um, maybe twice, get it down again, and then we'll be ready for undercoating, priming and varnishing, etc.
Okay, great, so we've got the sanding done. Paddle's looking pretty nice, quite happy with that. If you think back to an earlier video, you'll remember that I had uh, used a couple of screws with some washers as some of the clamping pressure in some places. Now, they were actually strategically placed locations. And that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to deal with that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the pilot holes from where those screws were, I'm going to open them up, drill them out so that they can be thick enough to take a, a lashing. Now the lashing at this end of the paddle is purely and simply to allow us a, a solid securing point. If you imagine you're sailing along and this is laying on deck, you want it to be tied down very securely. And it's no good just wrapping ropes around it because it can eventually work itself free. If you've got some holes going through the blade, it is not going anywhere. Okay, so we've got a couple of big holes in here, we'll drill them out, get a lashing in there so we can tie it to the stanchion. On the other end of the blade, however, it's a slightly different reason. Uh, I'm not 100% sure you can actually see that. We notice there's a couple of holes in here. And the purpose for those, again, will allow us to lash it down at the other end. But the main reason is to allow a lashing, or a lanyard, to go from the shaft down to the deck where you're standing and that'll clip in there and that'll be permanent while you're actually using the oar. Initially it will stop the oar from disappearing overboard if you take a bump or drop it or whatever but its main purpose is actually to hold down the, the paddle end here, the shaft, keep it down. As you're using the, the oar, sculling it back and forth, there's going to be pressure exerted on the upper side of the blade which will force it down into the water and that's the sculling action, that's the action that will move the, the boat forward, the force that will move the boat forward. The force exerted downwards on the blade is going to then, because it's on a pivot on the roll lock back here, it's going to force the handle upwards. So dead simple, you lash that down to the deck so you're not having to counteract that with body weight or muscles which will tire you out faster and make the paddle less uh, useful. Sweet. So while that dries, I'm going to turn my attention to the rowlock. Now the rowlock is simply a galvanised rowlock and I'm going to fit that to the back of the boat. In the inside of this, I'm just going to be lashing up with some artificial hemp and that is just to give a little bit of protection to the leather. Uh, against abrasion in use. Uh, so I'm going to seize this with some poly hemp and then I'm going to varnish over the top of it then bolt leather the ore. Easy to do, cheap and quick to replace on the fly. So this next bit here is especially easy. I'm going to take some old off varnish and I'm just going to use my finger like a paintbrush and paint it on. The idea is to try and get as much varnish absorbed into the actual fibres of this so that it kind of uh, transfers the, the lashing into almost like a, a plastic film almost. So it's, it's, it's very thick and uh, glued together almost. And this is going to do two things. First of all, it's going to smooth down the actual fibres, make them less prone to abrasion. 
and equally less prone to rub down the leather on the actual paddle itself. It works like a weather protection, so it actually stops the fibres from being exposed to too much UV, prolonging the use of the fibres in the string. Uh, it also reduces the rubbing of the galvanising on top of the actual rowlock itself, so it keeps the rowlock going a little bit longer. And it also works like a glue that actually sticks these fibres together uh, and keeping them all intact and well stuck so they don't start to unravel if one of the fibres becomes frayed. The finger is optional. I'm doing it because it saves using a paintbrush and I'll just rub the glove on a rag and the glove is fine too. So it's a little bit of an easier, cheaper way given that this doesn't need to be pretty in any way, shape or form. Sculling, start with a couple of good deep hard throws just to get the power going and the boat momentum moving. You can see the flex in the oar, there's a lot of bowing going on there. There's a lot of force coming at the back of that blade and then settle into a nice even row after that. Keep it nice and steady and smooth. One-handed holding a camera is not very rhythmical, I'm afraid. Glassy calm conditions. You can see the heat haze or the mirage over on the horizon there over by there's Aunt Agatha and dutifully towing behind. Tracking sunrise, it's about 6am just now. Come back towards the 
Harbour and over at the beautiful spot of Ely. See a little ripple forming there, so I'm going to get my sails up in a minute. Superb. Well, thank you once again for stopping by and checking out this nice little video on sculling and making a sculling oar uh, for a small coastal cruising yacht. Um, I hope it's inspired you. I mean, at the end of the day, going to sea is one of life's greatest pleasures, and at least in the UK, it is still one of our great freedoms. It's very little regulation in place outside of common sense. You're very much um, allowed to be free. So I, I hope we're able to continue that. But the key understanding in, in that permission and that allowance is that we use our common sense and we exercise good seamanship. Um, and you don't have to be a great sailor to be a great seaman. And seamanship is all about knowing your ropes, knowing common sense, knowing what your boat is capable of, being smart, um, and being capable, I think is the biggest thing. The, uh, the, the, the Royal Lifeboat are not there to bail out fools. They're there to help people who are genuinely in distress. And people who go to sea for the fun, and they should go to sea for the fun of it, but without an understanding of what they're doing, are putting themselves and uh, lifeboat members, Coast Guard members, etc., in, in real danger as well as costing a lot of money um, and so if you can help their burden a little bit ease their burden a little bit by learning some simple seamanship such as how to skull I mean at the end of the day you might be in a channel somewhere and you're stuck and you've got a stick or a spinnaker boom and a couple of bolts and you can nail a washboard or something to it and you can make shift uh, a sculling oar that might get you out but having the skill to actually use that sculling oar needs practice and I hope little videos like this might inspire you to try it. Just go out and try it in a dinghy, try it in whatever. Just get the skill under your belt so that when next time you go to sea, um, you're prepared. Yeah, here endeth the lesson. <laughs>